Medications for Opioid Use Disorders in Correctional Settings Shifting the Paradigm Creating a Balanced Correctional and Rehabilitative Approach The Opioid Response Network is funded by SAMHSA to provide resources and technical assistance needed locally to address the opioid crisis. This video is part of a series to provide guidance on the implementation of medications for opioid use disorder in correctional facilities. Leading corrections and behavioral health experts present information on topics such as the use of medication, models of delivery, diversion, and linkages to care and community support. Tammy Campbell, Alma Jackson, Ray Simpson, and Shannon Robinson discuss organizational change. Tammy Campbell is here from the Washington Department of Corrections. Did you wave? I didn't oh, look. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then instead of Alma Jackson, we have Linda Barker here from Washington as well. Uh, we have Ray Simpson from Washington Department of Corrections. And then we have Dr. Shannon Robinson from Health Management Associates, who will be talking about California Department of Corrections. So please welcome them to the stage. So we have the standard um, opioid response network slides and I want to check and see if people in the back okay we're hoping to not have to hand the mic back and forth so hopefully uh, uh, you can hear both of us and if you can't please let us know so we can try to position the mic so that you can hear us all Okay, we um, already got a quick introduction, but I'll let um, each of my colleagues introduce themselves in their role within the Washington Department of Corrections. Good morning. I'm Tammy Campbell with the Washington State Department of Corrections, currently serving as the Health Services Opioid Grant Administrator. I've been in that position since um, September 2017, overseeing the state targeted response grant as well as the current state opioid response grant. Been with the Department of Corrections for 33 years. Um, really, um, this is important work that I've been involved in and happy to be a part of it and making the difference in the lives of those individuals that we serve. And good morning. I am here in place of Alma Jackson. I am the Health Services Substance Abuse and Recovery Unit Opioid Grant Manager, and I am in charge of also the state targeted response and the state opioid response grant for the um, reentry division for the violator population. Good morning. My name is Ray Simpson. I'm the chief nursing officer for the uh, Washington State Department of Corrections. I've been a psychiatric nurse for over 30 years, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks. And then I'm Shannon Robinson, and I previously, until a month ago, was the chief of addictions in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And then a month ago, I moved over to um, Health Management Associates, which is a consulting firm um, and I'm helping other people uh, implement, design and implement and provide technical assistance for this work that I've essentially been doing both at the Veterans Administration as well as in California Corrections for the last 15 years. So that is my conflict of interest. Um, and uh, the other thing is that this morning at 5.30, which is... 2.30 in California, I woke up and said, I don't work for the Department of Corrections anymore, yet I have California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation logos on my slides. Because for five years, that's what I had on all my slides. So I have a request um, for the group, which is to please not take any pictures of my slides. <laughs> because I either need to adjust my slides or um, get approval from CDCR that their logo can stay on the slides. <laughs> so um, 
it, it's been a tough transition for me. I'm having a little trouble cutting the cord from uh, corrections, but we're here today to talk about culture change. And so I wanna start the presentation with what are the steps for culture change? So first, you need to identify the problem. And that problem may be different for different people's correctional institution. So for some people, it may be simply untreated opioid use disorder, or the problem might be the number of overdoses you have inside your institutions, or upon release from institutions, or the amount of funds that you're spending on healthcare related to opioid use disorder. So you're gonna have to identify the problem in your own institution. Then you need to organize a team to address the problem. The team needs to include administration and leadership, staff from all disciplines, and don't forget your patients and family members. The reason I've broken out administration and leadership here is I think it's really important that we address both groups of people. It may be that your secretary of corrections or your governor came to you and said, you're gonna do this. That's an administrator saying that. It also could be that the leaders, um, local leaders or divisional leaders, discipline leaders have come to your administration and said, we think that this is important and we need to address this problem. Everyone needs education and everyone needs to be moved forward in the process of change. So don't um, forget your administrators and your leadership because if your administrators and your leadership are not on board, you're never gonna be able to get line staff on board because they're gonna follow what their leaders do. You need to identify your desired outcome. So that could be decreasing your number of emergency department send outs from your institution or decreasing death. For some people it may just be decreasing or avoiding litigation. It could be decreasing recidivism. You're gonna have to identify that for your own institution. Then you need to assess your organization. What resources are needed? What are the barriers? And what is the stage of change that your organization is in, as well as the stage of change that your staff are in? And different staff may be at different stages of change. And your organization and the different divisions of your organization may be at different stages of change. So don't forget to think about the organizational stage of change. Then you need to identify your target audiences. Again, it's important to make sure that all the right people are at the table, so don't forget your external stakeholders. And identify the approach so which medications are you gonna use? What formulations? What target patients are you gonna um, first target? Then you're gonna design a plan and you need an implementation plan and a maintenance plan because most change gets implemented and then kind of phases out and dwindles down. Then you've got to evaluate your progress and you've got to revise plans based on the feedback that you're getting and the data that you're getting. I'm gonna turn it over to Washington for a few minutes to talk about their facilities. Thank you, Shannon. So when we talk about the Washington State Department of Corrections, what does that look like? So in Washington, we have 12 state prison facilities, eight of those majors and four minors. For us, the minors, the camps are identified for those individuals that have, are serving or have less than four years on their sentence. And we also are responsible for 12 work releases. I think some other states also refer to those like reentry centers. Um, our average daily population is just over 19,000 individuals. For the state of Washington, all of the jails are under separate jurisdictions, so we have no obligation responsibilities to those individuals. However, we do also supervise individuals um, on supervision, and that current population is about 21,000 individuals. Majority of the population on supervision, about 51% of those are individuals who have never gone to prison. They just have come to us directly from court or from the jails. Next is just to show a picture of the state of Washington and um, the geography. 
So as you see, majority of what's in the yellow is pretty much um, rur or rural communities, um, pretty spread out. We have currently three prisons over there. Majority of our population, resources, communities are on what's identified in the blue and the purple. Anything else about your facilities? That's good. All Thank right. <laughs> so California. Before we talk about our facilities, I also want people in, in the process of making change, you need to think about the state of your state. So your environment and your external stakeholders, super important. So when the legislators of California mandated a medication-assisted treatment pilot program be done in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, no jails in the state were doing medication-assisted treatment, and no medication-assisted treatment was occurring within our state prison system. Additionally, the legislators very wisely mandated continuity of care to the community. So a lot of what I did in the first year was develop those connections to the community, and it actually took three years before all 58 counties actually communicated with me. Um, so I was really excited at the beginning of that third year when I finally got the 58th county to break down and start having conversations about people returning to their community and what they were gonna do. So the state has to move at the same time as your institution or your county has to be moving at the same, not necessarily the same rate, but it does have to move. Um, and our state decided to use our STR and SOAR funds to have a statewide strategic plan. And that statewide strategic plan, the overarching goal was no wrong door. And so that advisory group is called Treatment Starts Here. And every SOAR grantee or STR grantee gets together quarterly so that everyone knows what other people's projects are and how they overlap and um, what's coming next from where and from whom and those kinds of things. A couple of the initiatives that were done in California I think are really important and could be models for other states and counties. And those include a medication-assisted treatment county criminal justice learning collaborative, where over a two and a half year period, we have had 29 of our 58 counties join um, and pledge to have two forms of medication-assisted treatment available, or three, by the end of their 18 months of participation. So we're in our second cohort now. And of the 29 counties that have participated, already 19 of those counties have two or three forms of medication-assisted treatment. When I first told counties in this collaborative that they could no longer use the state prison system as a reason to not treat the patients in the county jail because we were no longer going to be taking people off of medication-assisted treatment, that... Some people, you know, breathed a sigh of relief and other people felt that that was kind of spurring them on. Additionally, we felt it was important to touch all the people on the outside of criminal justice that influence our patients. So we started another project called County Touch Points where we are educating all of the district attorneys um, and the public defenders and the child protective service workers and the judges with discipline specific information for them so that they know about medication assisted treatment and its effectiveness and are on the same page with the rest of the state. So those are some of the um, things from a state of the state perspective that I think would be helpful for people to look at. In California, our jails and prisons are separate. In our prison system, we have 124,000 people that are in the prison system or in a reentry program, spread out over 35 prisons, nine community reentry programs, and 42 camps. And our um, offender population provides a lot of our wildfire suppression in California. So those 42 camps are seriously important um, 
points for California. We additionally have another 52,000 that are being monitored by parole. Our prisons, just like in Washington and probably every other state, are spread out geographically from the Oregon border, the Nevada border, the Arizona border, the Mexican border, and everywhere in between. And as you can imagine, as I already discussed also, in the 58 counties, originally there were only 12 counties that actually had medication-assisted treatment programs. But now I can say that all 58 counties have access to medication-assisted treatment in some form or another. Back to Washington. So when we're looking at the populations to serve to address um, the opioid epidemic, what we first started under the grant in September 2017 is first initially we started just doing outreach to those individuals in prison or work release with opiate use disorder and um, doing outreach to them, seeing if they were interested in medication assisted treatment. If they were, then what we would do was coordinate a conference call with a community provider. Usually that occurred two weeks prior to release. Um, initially, it was real important early on to build those partnerships and collaboration with those community providers. Um, and like I say, with our population, we know they're not really responsible and follow through. And so having what we call that warm handoff, having that um, the conference call would include the patient, the community provider, um, the classification counselor at the facility, and one of our rancher care navigators. So during that call, it's like the provider is asking the patient questions, um, identifying what medication they like to get on. Then we end the conference call with basically, okay, so you're going to get released on Tuesday. So then on Wednesday, you're going to go to Ideal Options or whatever community provider it is and have an appointment and start the process to get on medication. We've been very, very fortunate that we're able to get an appointment with a community provider within 24 to 48 hours of release. Probably the only exception to that is some of our providers and some of the counties, they're not open on a um, Friday, so sometimes the patient isn't able to see them until um, Monday, um, but majority of providers are able to get them in within 24 to 48 hours. And once again, it's like kudos to all those community providers, because that conference call that they're taking time out of their day to participate in, they're not being covered for that, you know? And so truly, I appreciate the collaboration efforts that we've had with our community providers in Washington State. So initially, like I said, we started doing outreach, just referring people, warm handoff to the community providers upon release. Then the next population that we did is we looked at our um, individuals who were on community supervision, who were already out on medication in the community, and if they violated their conditions of supervision, they would normally go to a local jail. Early on, um, a lot of our jails were not providing any type of medication-assisted treatment, so as an agency, we decided it's like, instead of them going to the jail, being tapering off, we feel that we want to commit to serving this population so instead of the community corrections officer arresting them, um, taking them to county jail and withdrawing, they would arrest them, take them to one of our six prison facilities, and we would continue them on the buprenorphine. So they'd serve their violation time, get back out in the community, be connected again to their community provider. Then in this year, we moved to those of ind individuals who are currently incarcerated. Um, and who have opiate use disorder identified either through an assessment by our substance use and disorder professionals or there's been a diagnosis by a medical or mental health provider. So a person's been diagnosed with opiate use disorder, then a rancher care navigator, um, once again, does outreach to the patient, usually because there's limited number of rancher care navigators. Ideally, I'd like them to do, have face-to-face -face conversations or orientations with them. Um, but majority of that converse, or communication is done through um, a kiosk or through communication to an email to a classification counselor. Once again, asking the individual, are you interested in medication-assisted treatment? If the person is, then if it's at one of our induction sites, then we send a referral to the medical staff who then go through appropriate steps to get the person, you know, your analysis, get lab works done, and gets them screened. For currently in the Department of Corrections, we offer both the naltrexone and the buprenorphine. 
if the person chooses, um, once again, it's a collaboration, it's a discussion between them and their provider, which medication they choose to get on. If they choose to get on um, the naltrexone, then we start them on the oral tablets 21 days prior to release and then do the injection 14 days prior to release. If it's um, on the buprenorphine, we start that 60 days prior to release. Once again, the reentry care navigator also, if we even induct them, we're then referring them out to um, a provider with an appointment within 24 to 48 hours. Um, all individuals that we do outreach to, whether it's individuals in prison or some of the outreach that we do in the jails, everybody gets overdose prevention education and is offered an naloxone kit upon release. So once again, it's a, their choice not to participate in medication, that's okay, but we want to give them another tool to put in their tool cap just in case something happens. Um, Currently, um, we're in the process, just sent some protocol for doing continuation, discontinuation on patients who come into our facilities at admission um, that are either on it, um, who currently are in medication-assisted treatment. And so the, um, the protocol indicates, so if a person is, comes to us, has a sentence of six months or less, we're going to continue them on the um, buprenorphine or the naltrexone. If they're on methadone, because we don't prescribe methadone, um, they would then be tapered off from methadone to buprenorphine. Um, if a person has six months or more, we would then taper them off. Ideally, I see it down the road that basically we'd be treating everybody for the period of time that we have them incarcerated. I think we went through this? I think we did. Yeah. All right. So now looking at the um, populations that we chose to target in California. So we wanted, we have 127,000 people incarcerated. We could not launch a program to evaluate 127,000 patients at one time. We had to pick some targets. So um, high risk targets. People coming in on medication-assisted treatment, we wanted to continue them no matter what they were on, and they will be continued, um, and all of our patients will be treated throughout the duration of incarceration if that is what is indicated for that individual patient. But we didn't want to take someone off of medication who was already on medication because that would lead them to cravings and relapse and possibly death, which you cannot rehabilitate a deceased person, then we have not met our goal as a department. So we will continue medications. On the other end of the spectrum, people leaving are at 40 times um, the risk of dying of an overdose than the general population. Well, we've got to target those people who are leaving as well, and then we can't ignore what's going on in the institution. So unfortunately, I don't know what it's like in your state or your county, but in California, we do have people die of opioid overdose while incarcerated. Again, that's not acceptable to us, and so we need to target um, anybody who's had an overdose or anybody that is coming to our attention um, due to a medical or mental health issue that is related to their drug use. So our hepatitis C patients, Anybody going out with endocarditis, cellulitis, abscesses, people getting admitted for um, suicidal ideation in the context of a substance use disorder, um, those types of things. Then after we launch that, we will be launching universal screening for people coming in and then universal screening for all those people who are already in CDCR. That will provide us with information to go to the next phase of how many people do we really have in our institutions who have an opioid use disorder? Because we don't know for sure that the percent of people in California prisons with an opioid use disorder is the same as the percent in Washington or Rhode Island. It could be that due to different sentencing laws in different places, that there could be a different percentage of people with opioid use disorder, or there could be a different percent uptake of medication-assisted treatment amongst different populations as well. Back to Washington. 
So we identified four challenges um, when we implemented um, this program. One was diagnosing opiate use disorder. How were we going to do that? Of course, operational logistical issues. Um, how do we work with our violator population and in some around community reentry and never knowing when release dates are? <laughs> so um, some of the diagnostic challenges, um, first one was creating protocols. <clears throat> we had no protocols for assessments. We didn't know how we were going to titrate. We didn't know how we were going to maintain and monitor. We had no idea how we wanted to do an induction. Um, we didn't know who was going to do what, when, and where. So that was, has been a huge undertaking. Another challenge is the electronic input um, of diagnoses using ICD-10. We still have paper charts. Um, we have very, very archaic computer programs. And um, several of our staff are still using ICD-9. Um, we also had the challenge of differentiating opioids used and opioid use disorder, um, and a lot of that was due to um, lack of education and misunderstanding our patients. And the other challenge um, was we are using a variety of SUD assessments um, for uncertain cases, so huge challenges in just diagnosing. <clears throat> The other challenge that um, we have come across is the just plain old operational issues. We want to get everybody on the same page. Um, we definitely have silos um, between health services, custody and non-custody. Um, we actually have silos within our silos. Um, we are challenged between trying to figure out whose roles and responsibilities. Uh, we are still trying to decide who does a mouth check. Is that a custody thing or is that a nursing thing? Uh, lots of broken communication uh, between all parties. Uh, scheduling conflicts. We want to, nurses want to provide the medications in the morning. Our custody staff, they say they don't have staff until the evening. So we're trying to work all that out. Um, and then we have things like, well, um, health services, we're just coddling the patients. We're just being too nice. We're just feeding them drugs. So we're really having to work on educating. Um, some of the unforeseen challenges were clinical capacity. Um, with all of our different facilities, everyone is built differently. Some of them have beautiful spaces that we can accommodate patients. Others, we are trying to figure out, do we use the dining room? Do we use the library? Are we going to use the education room? Um, it's just trying to figure out how to work in our, our clinical spaces. Um, short staff. Uh, we don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough custody staff. Um, and we are always, there's always a, a crisis. So if there's a medical crisis, now we're taking nurses and custody staff to deal with that medical crisis, which leaves us with our mat line without anybody to manage it. So we've got to figure out how to use those resources. Um, risk of diversion. Um, and this isn't just our patients. We have seen diversion amongst our staff as well. We need to be looking at that and making considerations. Uh, risk of harm to our patients. Uh, they're being bullied by their peers, um, and unfortunately, sometimes they're being harassed by staff because staff just don't understand how important our MAT program is. And then confidentiality. Custody want to know. They want to know why the patients are coming um, to get their medications. What's their diagnosis? They don't understand why they, it's not important for them to ha have that information. We struggled with, do we call the patients and say, everybody line up for MAT line. Now we've just identified all those patients that are currently on Suboxone. So we had to get creative on how to uh, manage that. Uh, also, there's lots of differences in just the recovery philosophies. Many people believe abstinence is best. Um, some people say um, they can't get their drugs in prison, so they're going to be fine because they're drug-free. Um, some people say, hey, the shots are better. Let's just give it once a month. Uh, the pill is better. Oh, let's use the film. But, you know, so there's a lot of discussion about what's the best form. Um, people say our, our patients are clean. Um, Matt just feeds the addiction. Um, and also that um, we're just enabling them, and we don't need to treat it because it's not a problem. So lots of things um, just involving people's philosophy and understanding of the disease. So with the violator population, um, the struggles that we've had uh, since 2017 is we have individual contracts with each jail to provide bed space for anybody, uh, any individual that violates the conditions of their community custody. So when we started this in 2017, we had uh, 
seven facilities that we targeted uh, through the STR grant to provide SUDP services to uh, the individuals that had violated. And so what we did was we provided brief risk intervention screening and referral to treatment, uh, education on MAT, what the different kinds of medications are and what, uh, you know, went through the treatment decision-making tool as part of it to see what kind of treatment they wanted. So with that being said, when the SOR grant came in, uh, we changed that to providing full substance use disorder ASAM assessments and our SUDPs, we now have seven uh, in nine facilities. And we also provided, uh, we, we actually hired five care navigators in order to um, follow the individual after they leave custody to lower the barriers to treatment and to provide resources for housing, food bank, clothing bank, anything that they need that would lower the barriers to getting to treatment. Um, and with each individual jail having its own contract, I uh, actually traveled all over the state to the prospective uh, jail sites uh, that we had contracts with and presented what we wanted to do within their jail. At the point in time we started this, we had only one jail that was providing MAT services. Um, that has increased to seven of the nine facilities that we are in actually provide M some form of MAT treatment. Um, so, and each facility have their own policies and procedures with how they run the jail. And so uh, we as Department of Corrections have to abide under their uh, policies and procedures and background checks and fingerprinting and such in order for our staff to be able to go in and provide those services to DOC offenders. Um, and it helped a lot when we started using the prisons as uh, short-term. Uh, we would send for the rural areas that did not have MAT treatment in the community, we actually uh, would be able to uh, have them placed in a prison for a short period of time in order to receive continuation of MAT services. And uh, community reentry. This is a really big thing. When we first started, we, my staff, contacted. Uh, what we found was is that our individuals, even though they may be housed in one county, are actually from another county. And so, instead of just doing county resources per facility, mm -hmm. we had to do a statewide resource list for our staff. And I had staff calling uh, for the first three months every treatment provider in Washington State to find out if they provided MAT services. And if they did, did they take Medicaid? Did they take Medicare? Did they take private insurance? In order to have resources for our individuals to um, be inducted and to have treatment services in the community where they're being released. Because in our state, if you are releasing to a county, you release back to that county, and if you go out of county, it's a violation. So we had to work really diligently in order to find providers in each and every city, county, uh, because they couldn't transition from one county to another without prior approval. Um, work release versus community uh, release is uh, a little different because when we're releasing to a work release site, uh, they're still under DOC uh, jurisdiction and they're still considered incarcerated. And so that uh, posed a little bit of a problem with uh, trying to get uh, our work release guys uh, to be inducted in the community but still be incarcerated. 
Um, unknown release dates. This is a big one for the violator population uh, because we have the swift and certain. Um, they can spend anywhere from three days to 30 days in jail for a violation, uh, depending. So when they have their hearing, they could be released at five o'clock the next morning. And without a release date, it's really hard to make an appointment for uh, SUD services out in the community if we don't know when they're releasing. So we're still working on that piece. Uh, it's still an issue. Uh, but we are seeing as many people as we can. Since the grant started, we have contacted over 8,000 individuals releasing from jail or um, prison uh, for the violator population. Um, unexpected releases, that's another one. Uh, they have good time and they uh, are released and uh, there is no... Um, Forewarning. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. There's no forewarning. There, there's no forewarning. Uh, we have an estimated release date that we can use. However, that date could have passed months ago, and so uh, we don't know when that happens. Um, and we have others that uh, that release from prisons that end up having a county detainer and end up going to county facing other charges. Uh, that they incurred prior to being in DOC custody. So that's another issue. We also have a uh, DOC violator population that end up with new charges and we have no idea when we go in to see them uh, when they're going to get out on those charges and they could go to court and be released that very moment. So those are some of the struggles that we have had. Um, and uh, the state targeted response grant uh, kind of rolled over into the state opioid response grant. And so for the violator population, uh, we went from a staff of four to a staff of 14. And so uh, getting everybody up and trained and uh, placed in the right facilities and uh, managing that statewide uh, can be a little challenging at times. So California had all of the same challenges that Washington had. I'm sure no matter right which state or um, county we talk to for anybody who's implemented, the challenges are the same. But I think that if we start um, with education, then our, our other challenges are less if everybody's on the same page. So if we can get people to understand the neurobiological nature of this disorder and that this is a chronic disorder, then that can be very helpful. Um, because people can believe that it's a neurobiological disorder, so they know that someone needs medication-assisted treatment, but they don't realize that this is a chronic disorder for most people, not for everyone, and that therefore people need medications long term. So if you miss a piece of this, that affects what people think about your treatment. So it's really important um, to make sure that everyone gets the same uh, or some basic level of education. And to acknowledge diversion, don't try to sweep it under the carpet, tackle it head on, and also to address this issue of psychosocial treatment. So we've already heard that not everyone has access to psychosocial treatment in their jail or their prison. However, you may have access to people in the community to come in to do 12-step meetings. Now we've tried um, to say that we don't consider 12-step meetings to be treatment per se. It's social support, it's peer support, and it can be exceedingly helpful, and some people get sober that way. Don't get me wrong. But we, we have lofty goals in California. We want people to get psychosocial treatment as well. However, if there are wait lists to get into your psychosocial treatment, then you want someone to have some support. And so letting the people in your institution know what the psychosocial support component, whether it be 12-step meetings or smart recovery meetings or um, actual cognitive behavior therapy, letting them know that is really important. 
and then also letting them know the difference between someone taking medication without psychosocial support and somebody getting both psychosocial support and treatment. So for opioid use disorder, at least, our evidence is that medication is the key component, okay? That abstinence-based treatments fail 80 to 90% of the time. So that helps people understand why medication is the linchpin for that patient population. And then um, that continuity of care is going to be available in the community upon release. That's another barrier. Um, so psychosocial treatment and continuity of care are barriers that a lot of people present as well as diversion and um, these other issues here. All right, now to successes. <clears throat> Yay, the good things, the good news. <laughs> So um, I would say there are several successes that we've had at Washington. Um, individuals that were previously untreated for their OUD are now receiving treatment. Um, we have an overdose prevention education program and uh, the Narcan distribution program, which has been very successful for us. Uh, we have improved our partnerships with community providers. We've definitely improved the, the teamwork between our custody and health services teams. Um, we have a new addiction specialist that is developing clear OUD protocols, training, and weekly clinical meetings, which has been phenomenal. She does a telephone conference. Anybody can call in, um, and she does the first 10 to 15 minutes is just a brief education. She might pick something, some topic, um, um, and then the rest of the call is, does anybody have any key questions about a particular clinical case? And it's just really a brainstorming, problem-solving work together. Um, we're also collecting data so we can capture our success and share our story. Um, we are having the opportunity to add um, a patient navigator nursing position that will actually able to help our patients through the OUD treatment process and connect them with our re-entry navigators. Um, and I guess number one um, success is lives are being saved each and every day. All right, so California successes. So I've already talked a little bit about the legislators mandating a pilot program, and I wanna speak a little bit to that pilot program. So the legislators gave us nine months to design, implement, treat, and write a legislative report. I had previously rolled out medication-assisted treatment at the San Diego Veterans Administration and, and helped a little with the national rollout of medication-assisted treatment in the VA. So I had a lot of experience with rolling out these programs and enhancing psychosocial treatment as well. So I knew the amount of resistance um, was going to prohibit me from initiating an agonist-based treatment program and treating patients and writing a legislative report within nine months. That just was not gonna be feasible at the time. Our organization was not ready yet for that stage of culture change. So um, I took the path of least resistance and then showed people some successes so that we could move forward to the next stage. So we started with naltrexone and acamprosate for alcohol and opioid use disorder. And then we showed success in treating patients and we showed success in warm handoffs. And I believe part of the, um, our ability to get funding for our next phase has to do with the fact that we were able to show that if you have dedicated staff treating patients and doing warm handoffs to the community, that you can actually get over 60% of your patients following up in the community. That was more than double the number that had been in our HIV population or our severely mentally ill following up in the community. So I think that was very impactful to show those successes to your funding sources so that they see that this will work. And then we included lots of people from the state for external stakeholder meetings, and that was important in our designing our um, eventual program. Focus groups are really important, um, and it's important that you listen to what people say in the focus groups the medical staff, the custody staff, the patients. And if you're gonna do something different in your large rollout than you did in a pilot site, you need to be able to tell those pilot sites why you're doing something different because they're gonna to wanna to know that. 
and the other sites have all heard about what's going on in the pilot sites, and so you really need to message very clearly. Then you've got to design a plan, obtain funding, implement your plan, um, and, and I am a fan of incremental expansion. That's how I did things at the Veterans Administration, um, and that's how we've done things in California um, Department of Corrections as well. All right, lessons learned. I think we've heard this throughout the conference. It's all about education, education, education. It's like it's not a one-time thing. You go out and do training of staff. It's like it needs to be an ongoing basis. And once again, it's important when you're doing that education that who is your targeted population? Maybe your presentation and education to custody is a little different than your medical providers. Um, and once again, it's always, we, you know, we're doing this work for the patients, but not very often do we do, like, what do you think? Or So right now, currently, we're in the process of developing a survey that's going to be sent out to our patients currently involved in the MOUD program to say, to get some feedback. You know, how is it working? And then based upon their feedback, look at recommended improvements. Um, early on in the process of implementation, we, because it was all about the medication, we worked really close with the clinical staff on developing protocols, but we didn't do a very good job involving custody or involving our non-clinical staff. So once again, from the onset, include all parties that have a vested interest in, the, in this work. Um, also, importance of standardization of protocols and procedures. As you probably know, many of you in corrections, it's like each prison facility, in a sense, is kind of an island of its own, which is okay, and they have different issues and different barriers, but at the same time, there needs to be some standardization around some of the work. So, for example, originally we didn't have any protocol for how the pill line, the Suboxone, was going to be administered. Um, we found out what was happening at one facility was not happening at another one. It was like, oh my God, what are you doing? So, um, we you know, now have standardized process and procedures around many of the processes involving the MOUD. Once again, it's like with any new program, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, there's always going to be changes. You need to implement an opportunity for um, process improvement. And a, a big reminder to us is, once again, culture change doesn't take, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, you know, and so, but the work that we're doing, uh, making a difference in the lives of individuals, it's important work, it's, it's needed work, so don't get discouraged. It will happen over time. All right, on to what we learned in California and then tying it all together with our steps of culture change. So we, of course, learned all those same things. And um, I'm hammering the education point. I think it's really important to understand that you need the right education at the right time. And so early on in that stage of change, you need to change hearts and minds. Um, later on, you talk about more details about procedures. Um, and it's important to know that it takes seven times to hear something new in order for that change to occur. So I felt like, well, the prison system was way behind community standards, right? So it wasn't going to take near as long for this to happen in the correctional environment because it was already going on everywhere in the community. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, we may be able to speed this up a little faster than things rolled out at the VA, uh, but not a lot faster. It is still going to take time. The other thing is that you definitely need standardized procedures, but you also need to have enough flexibility within those procedures for your different jails or your different prisons to be able to implement um, in a way that works for them. Okay, so tying this all together with our steps of change. So step three was what is your desired outcome? And from an altruistic point of view, yes. To survive and thrive in a healthcare environment, you need to focus on population health outcomes and individual health outcomes and lowering the cost of care per capita because long term, treating the underlying disorder of why many of our individuals are incarcerated will decrease healthcare cost and probably long term decrease the cost of incarcerating these patients by decreasing recidivism. Up front, there's going to be some increased cost, but long term. 
and you want staff to enjoy their work. But those are all altruistic things. If you don't say what's in it for the person you're talking to right now and the person you're trying to educate, what's in it for them, they're not gonna buy into this change. So always remember what's in it for them. And step four is what stage of change is your organization in? So if your organization is pre-contemplative, then the education that you're providing right now has to do with just raising awareness of the problem multiple times in multiple different ways. If your organization has moved to contemplate change, then you can provide information about the effectiveness of the approach that you're thinking you're gonna implement. But people who are pre-contemplative are not ready to hear about effectiveness. And so Linda mentioned yesterday my experience um, during one of my talks this month where I had been forewarned that there was a group of resistant people at a single table in the room, and I was geared up to do my presentation for that table. Like, I was gonna watch their body language, I was gonna roll with their resistance, and what did they do when they saw the opening slide and my title? They all got up and left. They, they were not ready to hear the effectiveness of the approach. <laughs> they were not contemplative yet. They weren't. Had, I, had my entire presentation been just about ra raising awareness, they probably would have stayed to listen. Now, every other table in the room was in the contemplative or preparation or action stage. So, you know, messages got across, but nonetheless, you've got to know your audience and you've got to know where they are and what they're ready to hear at the time when you're presenting your education. So the right education at the right time. Common mistakes in managing resistance, because there will be resistance. So um, when I was originally asked to give this talk, I've never given a talk on the principles of change, culture change. I have been living culture change in the VA for over a decade, followed by um, the prison system for five years. And uh, had I known some of these principles of culture change when I started rolling things out at the VA, um, I think maybe it wouldn't have been a 10-year rollout. Maybe it actually would have been a five-year rollout. So you will get resistance even when you don't expect to get resistance. You'll get resistance from people you don't expect. And you need to realize that resistance is not logical. So don't try to approach it from a logical perspective. Someone talked yesterday about how there's that 10% on the bell curve that are very resistant. And if you focus all your efforts on that 10%, then you're not targeting your message to the other 90% of people, okay? That 10% may never change. Focus on their issues, hear their issues, but don't get stuck on them. And then um, don't ignore the emotion. If you can convert that emotion into positive change, that's an amazing phenomenon. And also, don't give up. <laughs> continue, continue. This is an ongoing process. Effectively managing resistance is the flip side of much of that we just talked about. So create rapport, create strong working relationships, establish expectations, and provide a context. And I think that that's super, super important. Um, in the California prison system, at least when I got there, mental health providers and medical providers didn't know how to refer to substance use disorder treatment, did not know what the substance use disorder treatment was that was going on, did not know um, in really anything about the rehabilitative component of what we were doing. And we're California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, like they added that R a decade ago um, or more. And healthcare was just this cog in the wheel. And so providing context can be super, super helpful. Explain change and what's in it for them. Ask open-ended questions and be prepared to listen. 
Be quiet the majority of the time. Listen to their concerns, address their concerns, try to create win-win situations, and constantly repeat the change management process. There will be new resistant people joining your organization all the time. Ingredients for effective change. The change has to be worth making, and we, I think everybody in this room agrees that this change is worth making. Leadership and administration must be committed to the change. You must have sufficient resources that may involve um, gathering data from other sites, um, other states, other counties, to show the effectiveness of this to your funding sources. Um, it may be doing a pilot program and showing the effectiveness. You need a plan and your providers need the skill to carry out that plan and you need to be persistent. Have the ability to learn from your mistakes and hopefully you learn from all of our mistakes that have been presented over the last two and a half days. And then broad participation and engagement. The broader the participation, I believe, the more successful that you're going to be. Thank you. Technical assistance is available to support the evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. To request technical assistance, visit opioidresponsenetwork.org.